Hi, my name is Jalia Kangabe, and I am ICTD's lead research consultant on gender and tax. So I grew up around enterprising, hardworking African women. One of those women was my mother who ran a fast food restaurant in Kampala. She would wake up at 4 a.m. and go to the market because if you went to the market at 4 a.m., you were able to buy goods directly from the truck as opposed to when they've made it to the stall. And that many times meant that you would get a number of goods at half the price, sometimes even less. So 4 a.m., she was at the market, got whatever she needed, and by six, her business was open. She'd be there from 4 a.m. all the way to 10 p.m. Right next to my mother was another lady called Musao, small pharmacy. Musao was there early morning, late into the evening, sitting by her shop, going out when she needed to get supplies. And now Musao actually runs, has so many branches of her pharmacy around Kampala. In Wondergare, there was also a market and one of the women that my mother constantly shopped from whenever she would run out of stuff that she hadn't gotten from the 4 a.m. market was called Nalongo. Nalongo is a mother, means mother of twins. Again, same thing. Nalongo was there. Nalongo was hardworking. Nalongo tried to get the best things for her customers. So I grew up watching what it meant to work really hard. I grew up watching and learning from real entrepreneurs who sometimes may not have had a formal education, but who had like some of the best business acumen that I know. But I also grew up watching some of the fears that these women experienced. I grew up watching my mother scared every time she received a huge electricity bill for her small business. The thing that was really, really scary was watching her dealing with the Revenue Authority. It, it was a very scary thing. And, you know, Uganda Revenue Authority over the years has changed the way it operates. But in those days, it was, it was scary when you had revenue authority officials coming and they're locking up your shops and you're here and you're receiving letters saying, oh, you have this tax bill to pay, you have this penalties, you have this, you know. So it, it was for her as a single mother who's running this thing, who does not have that much knowledge about taxation, it was very, very hard. And many years later, I, 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 I constantly ask myself the question, did my mother experience these issues with taxation because she was a woman? Did she experience it because that is what small businesses experience? And, and, and it's a question that we're constantly asking ourselves. Do men and women experience tax differently? Now, I have heard from some people who say, oh, you know, that there is no gender in taxation. Tax is a neutral instrument, you know? Why do you have to bring gender into yet another thing? Well, let's see why we have to do that um, in this lecture. So in this lecture, we're going to look at some of the conventional arguments that have been made about gender and tax and, and also quickly look at counter arguments. And then we'll look at some of the literature and research on the gender dimensions of taxation in low income countries, focusing specifically on African countries. Um, some work on gender and tax administration, gender and tax compliance. And then we'll just end with some um, areas and, and possible questions for future research. Biases in tax systems could be explicit or they could be implicit. Um, explicit in the sense that the law outrightly provides for a different treatment of men and women, either because of assumptions of the 
of the gender roles that they play or because of a desire to shift behavior in a certain direction. So in Nepal, for example, in 2015, there were changes to the law there which uh, provided for some exemptions for uh, land that was registered in the name of women or in the names of female children. So that's an explicit bias. Biases could be implicit, so you don't find specific provisions in the law saying, you know, I'll treat men and women differently, but biases arise either because of the way different genders participate in the market. So we may say that if there's some um, and fair laws in, in a market, for example, we could say they're more likely to disproportionately affect women because there's a huge representation of women in markets. They, the biases could also be as a result of consumption patterns, so household consumptions. Some of the literature has argued that, you know, if you put taxes on basic goods and services, women are more likely to suffer than men because women consume those goods more than men do. And, and biases could also arise because of the way taxes are administered. And we are going to look at a number of examples in the discussion. Um, there are a number of conventional arguments on gender and tax. There are three dominant arguments on um, the literature on gender and tax and also in debates uh, in, that are particularly made by civil society organizations. One of those is that um, explicit biases exist in personal income tax systems when married couples are required to file joint income tax returns. The argument being that women normally earn less than men. So when you require that married women need to file joint income tax returns, then they're bound to be paying taxes at a higher rate than if they had filed independently. The counter argument to that, especially if we're looking at um, African countries, is that explicit biases have been removed from most tax laws. More importantly, like majority of women and men actually in African countries are not employed in the formal sector. Indeed, less than 5% of Africa's adult um, employed population pays personal income tax, personal income taxes compared to about 50% in high income countries. The second argument that is often made is that Implicit biases exist when um, taxes such as value added tax are imposed on basic goods and services because it's women who often co consume these goods. Um, the counter argument to that is that many countries now either zero rate or exempt basic goods and services from VAT. Similarly, particularly in low-income countries. Low-income earners purchase goods from traders who are not VAT registered, meaning that they will not be paying uh, VAT. The third argument that is often made is that governments need to raise more money by taxing multinationals and that when governments offer huge tax incentives to multinationals they fail to collect taxes that you know are essential to provide basic goods and services that benefit women now now on the face of it this argument is very very appealing however we have limited evidence to suggest that when governments raise more money they're necessarily going to invest that money in goods and services that benefit women. So the, the, we, we have very little research to show us that if governments raise more revenue, they're going to spend more on education, they're going to spend more on health. So again, more investigation is needed before making such statements. How might we more usefully think about the gender dimensions of taxation in the context of low-income countries, specifically in the African continent.
Well, first of all, we have to recognize the fact that there are differences in, in, in the manner in which men and women um, in high and low income countries participate in the labor force. In high income countries, you're more likely to find formal kind of employment, formal kind of participation, while in low income countries, it's more informal. And that also has an implication for the kind of taxes that are paid by men and women. And related to that is it's important particularly for low-income countries to expand our definition of taxation. Because if we understand taxation to simply mean the mainstream taxes, such as income tax and value-added tax and import duty, then um, our research will show that we leave out a significant fiscal burden that is, is borne by men and women in low-income countries, particularly in Africa. Um, we also need to understand the impact of gender on tax administration and understand what drives tax compliance. Thinking about labor force participation, there are three main ways in which women in African countries participate in the labor force. So they're women like me and, and, and my high school and university friends who you will more likely find employed in the formal sector. Then the women like my mother, who and 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 Musao, the doc, the the pharmacist that I told you about, who you will find owning, you know, smaller semi-formal businesses, and then there are women like Nalongo that I told you about, the market lady, and other women who are engaged in the labor force in by being employed in more informal settings. So looking at the tax implications of these, women like me who are formally employed constitute a very small percentage of African women. And for these, the main tax that you'll find is pay as you earn, which is withheld at source from your salary and not as much interaction between um, the taxpayer and the tax officials. Small businesses, like in African countries, have always been there, but they, they, the women and entrepreneurs are increasing. And, and what's happening now is that you find even people with formal and uh, formal education moving away from the formal sector and coming into the small business semi-formal sector. So a 2019 World Bank study found that 50% of African women are employed in the agricultural sector. Of the 50% that are not employed in the agricultural sector, 50% of those are entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurship is really on the rise and women are playing a significant role in that. Most females, uh, most female businesses will fall under two broad categories the the small what we call small business um what what we talked about my my mother and and musao and then you'll find those in the informal sector so you find those um in markets you find those like petty traders you find them on on the streets sometimes the street hawkers you find um you find them in salons, hair salons, like small, you know, some of them are mobile salons. So the, the, those are the two broad categories. And you find that they pay um, presumptive, mostly what we call um, presumptive taxes. So because they do not keep um, records of account, the if, if they do pay income taxes, the revenue authorities will sort of estimate what their gross um, turnover is and then impose a tax on that gross, gross turnover. Um, and it's called different things in different countries. So sometimes they'll be referred to as presumptive taxes. In other parts, they'll be referred to as turnover taxes. In some cases, they're referred to as just fixed rates.
Despite the important role that, that small businesses play in, in Africa's economy, we have very few studies that examine the gender dimensions of tax in these businesses. Uh, and so we really don't know a lot about, you know, how women and men in small businesses experience like the differences in their in their tax experiences. There was, however, a study that was conducted in Zimbabwe where um, the, the, the researchers came up with some hypothetical monthly incomes and compared um, pres the presumptive tax regime with uh, the personal income tax regime of, of, you know, salaried employees and corporate income tax regime of, of, of uh, businesses. And they concluded that presumptive taxes were highly regressive because uh, when they compared those three different regimes, they found that people, particularly in the lowest bracket, ended up paying a lot more of their income in taxes when compared to others. Uh, for the case of hairdressers, for example, it came to effectively a tax rate of about 200%. While you did find instances where, for example, employees were at a zero rate. Um, there's also a study that was undertaken in Ghana where um, the, the, the researcher uh, studied a number of women-owned businesses, uh, including, you know, petty traders and, and, and women in markets and, and hairdressing salons and, and a number of other businesses and found that these uh, women were, were less likely to be educated about their tax liabilities, and that made them more vulnerable to extortion, bribery, and even demands for sexual favors. And, and this is something that I, I can really relate to, you know, um, uh, having grown up with a mother that that had a small business where you have all these different things that you have to think about you know your children and 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 bills to pay and and so you don't have that much education about um, taxation and so what happens is you know sometimes you meet revenue officials who try to take advantage of you know your lack of education who try to extort money and say you know if you if you give us some money will help this bill go away so so a, a real issue there about you know what can be done about taxpayer education and 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 what are the gender dimensions of it moving away from salaried employees and 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 a small uh, semi-formal uh, uh, businesses, uh, a significant proportion of um, market trade in, in Africa is carried out by women and 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 market authorities tax differently. Like in, in some markets, you will find that there's a fixed rate uh, paid by everyone in that market. It's normally a daily rate. In others, you'll find variations in the rate depending on the size of the business or depending on the types of goods that are sold. In addition, to market rates, um, uh, official market dues or what is called market fees in a number of jurisdictions, we find that there are a number of other payments that traders make, other, other fees, things like toilet fees, things like storage fees. And, and we're going to talk about why it's important to study those and, and look at those as a kind of tax, because many times it, it's payments that are made for the provision of um, public services. In, in, in an ICTD study uh, of flea markets in, in Harare, Zimbabwe, for example, uh, the researchers surveyed 448 uh, traders and they found that in addition to the presumptive taxes paid by these traders, there were a number of other tax, there were a number of other fees that, that the traders incurred. Uh, these included toilet fees where depending on the market that one was trading in, um, you were required to pay up to one dollar per toilet visit. Uh, then there were also storage fees, which was, you know, a number of markets on average it was about a dollar per day and then market fees themselves were about a dollar a day as well and the research has found that each of these disproportionately affected women for various reasons the toilet fees for example women ended up using the toilets more 76 percent of 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 men who who were uh, surveyed said that they use alternatives like 
peeing behind buildings or, or trees instead of you know using the toilets uh, the same percentage a similar percentage was seen when we were looking at um, um storage fees where you know 78 percent of women said that they pay for storing their goods while a number of the men carried their goods home every evening and even though the market fees were one dollar per day women ended up being disproportionately affected because they earned a lot less than than men for example 82 percent of women and less than 500 dollars per month while compared to 55 percent of men so the biases were not explicit but um for various reasons you know the various uh, biological and other reasons or, or or the kind of capital that was available to women they ended up being uh, disproportionately affected by these taxes and fees the the study in zimbabwe also found that the effective tax rates for market um, fees are sometimes higher than the rates that are paid by salaried employees for personal income taxes and corporate income taxes. Again, similar to the, to the previous study that was conducted in Zimbabwe, where it was found that you know, uh, the effective tax rates for presumptive taxes were higher than um, the rates for personal income taxes and corporate income taxes. Um, in a study in Tanzania, in, in, in nine markets in Dar es Salaam, the, the researchers found that the, the, the women really suffer a disproportionate burden uh, of toilet fees and that many times that the official uh, market fees, are, the, the toilet fees are a lot higher than the official market fees and, and found that women on average pay twice as much as men on toilet fees. So, so, so if we go back to the example that I gave of, of how long like like these women are likely to, to spend in those markets and you have and you have them going into the markets very early in the morning and leaving very late in the evening. So spending an average of about 13 hours a day in the markets. And in that in the study in Dar es Salaam, it was found that in, in most markets, the, the market rate was between 100 shillings to 200 shillings per day. While compare, compared to that, the toilet fees were between 200 shillings to 300 shillings per toilet use, you know. And while men could, could often pee in alleys or bushes, women had no alternative. So, you know, the alternative is either you use that um, toilet or you, you know, you don't drink the, the whole day and say, okay, I won't drink because I'll use the toilet less. Now think about a woman who is in her menstruation, menstrual periods. Think about a woman who's pregnant and, and how often they have to use the toilets. And, and in that study, it was found that women paid like up to 18 times more in toilet fees when compared to what they paid in market fees. And in, 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 in many cases, they paid up to 20% of their daily income in toilet fees compared to 13% um, that was paid by men. The findings in Tanzania and Zimbabwe echo what other researchers have found about the, the, the wide range of fees that are paid by Africans to access public services. And, and, and research is increasingly showing that um, the formal and informal user fees that are paid for essential services are sometimes a lot more than the formal uh, uh, taxes that are paid to governments. In, in Sierra Leone, for example, the researcher found uh, a 2018 ICTD study found that female headed household paid fewer formal taxes when compared to male headed household, but then they were more likely to pay a lot more in informal taxes to access community goods and services. It's similar to a 2017 study that was conducted in the DRC where 
They found that female-headed households paid significantly more than male-headed households to access public services such as water, um, electricity, sanitation, and health care. And, and we can see here where, while you know, women appear to pay less in informal user fee, you still see that it takes up a significantly higher percentage of their income than men. And then we, we see that rise when we look at informal taxes and fees where, you know, compared to, 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 to men, women are bearing a much um, higher burden of informal taxes and fees. And, and this is for the study in Sierra Leone where they were looking at um, households, um, male-headed households versus female-headed households. Even though there's an increasing body of research that shows that poor people, many of whom are women in African countries, pay a significant proportion of their income in informal taxes and fees, every time we present this work to, you know, government officials or mainstream scholars in conferences or meetings, the reaction is normally that, oh, that's, that's a really bad thing that's happening. And, and it should be addressed, but please don't confuse people. Stop calling these things taxes. Why? Because we have an idealized notion of what taxes look like. Taxes are income taxes, taxes are value added taxes, taxes are property taxes. And so they say, you know, all these others, th 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 those are toilet fees, those are, you know, it's, it's the same narrative that is often used to justify taxing the informal sector more. Let's say the informal sector doesn't pay taxes. We need to expand the tax base. And, and this is problematic because this idealized notion of taxation ignores the lived experiences of many people in African countries. It ignores the fact that many people in African countries make these payments to access public services the same way that people in high income countries pay to access public services. And, and, and there's a privilege attached to, you know, dismissing these payments. A privilege that says, because what you pay doesn't look like what we pay, we're not going to call it taxation. And it's problematic and it affects women disproportionately as we have seen and and we're hoping that we can we, we can address this you know we can address this conversation on informal taxes and you know hopefully find a solution to it Let, let's 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 now move to something else we've, we've spent the past minutes talking about uh, payments made by small businesses and people in the informal sector and 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 households um, so let's move now to gender and tax administration. There are two main ways in which we can look at the, the, the gender dimensions of tax administration. One way we could look at it is study the impact of tax administration on male and female taxpayers you know how how does tax collection affect men and women differently the other way we can look at it is what does it mean to have more women in a tax administration again these are areas where we have very little research but we we do have um some important and some some useful findings in in the literature and what we find um normally is when it comes to the experiences of taxpayers with tax administration, we find that there are normally distinctions between the experiences at the national level and experiences at the subnational level. For many African countries, face-to-face -face interaction with, with revenue officials has been replaced with electronic filing of tax returns and payments through banks. And what that means is that taxpayers now do not have to interact face-to-face um, -face with taxpayers, which, which reduces the, the, the chances of, of any of what we found before, you know, ex extortion or um, harassment. While at the subnational level, we find that 
because it's still a lot of physical enforcement, we're, we're more likely to find issues there. So a distinction between experiences at the national level and experiences at the subnational level. And we, we've also seen that um, from, from our previous um, discussion, we've also seen that many people in African countries do not pay taxes at the national level, meaning that, you know, their tax interaction with revenue authority and the tax payments that they've made are more likely to be at the subnational level. There is one exception uh, and, and that is customs. So, so we're more likely to see um, issues at uh, in customs administration at the national level because this is still a lot of face-to-face -face interactions. So, so we have a few studies in, in this regard and there's an ICTD study that was conducted in um, Nigeria in 12 markets. And in that study, the researchers found that male tax collectors were responsible for a significant percentage of cases of physical and verbal harassment, confiscating goods, and also asking for sexual favors. However, female traders were also found to be well represented when it came to asking for bribes. Um, it's not always like, 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 but it's not always only negative. Uh, in some cases, in a study in Ghana, for example, it was found that vulnerable women, um, normally like either pregnant women or elderly women or widows, normally received more respectful or preferential treatment for from tax officials in markets. In some cases, they were exempted from paying taxes. Um, and then we have a number of studies that are undertaken in markets and cross-border trade that all that note that women are more vulnerable to physical, verbal, and sexual harassment. And, and those are studies in, in a number of countries. So we've touched a bit on the experiences of female taxpayers with tax collection. So let, but what does it mean to have women in tax administration? In other words, you know, looking at it from the point of view of the tax collector. Um, in OECD countries, women account for about 60% of the total workforce. In, in, in tax administration. However, many of the women are found in the lower ranks. This percentage is significantly lower in African countries with it being between 25% to 30% and having considerable variations in, in between the countries with uh, countries that depend more on customs revenue having less women in, in their tax administration. Um, there are a number of questions that we can ask when we want to understand uh, the impact of gender on tax administration. One question we could ask is that, how does the gender composition of tax administrations affect, you know, how those administrations perform, their, their, their overall performance, for example, how the tax that they collect, you know. Um, we could also, find, we could also ask whether having more women in tax administration leads to better relationships with taxpayers. Another question that we can ask is to what extent does gender equity of the labor force affect the degree to which women feel valued at work? Now for all of these questions, we do not have a lot of research. However, we do have um, a study that was undertaken by the Uganda Revenue Authority, which, which, which has, you know, if, if you look at this, it, it does have at least a, a significant representation of women when compared to many tax administrations in African countries. And in that research, um, the, the, the URA officials that undertook it were looking mainly at, at data relating to human resources. And what they found that 
they, they made a number of findings. They found that women on average normally scored better than men when it came to their six monthly appraisals. They also found that women on average stayed much longer in the URA than men did. They stayed for about 12.3 years compared to 11.6 years for men. They also found women less likely to be subject to disciplinary action and that included things like termination, suspension or dismissal. Um, they, they, uh, and they found that both men and women felt satisfied about working in, mixed gen in a mixed gender environment. However, male uh, employees normally raised concerns about the fact that they were the ones who are normally sent to uh, remote areas in the country. Uh, again, useful findings, very useful if we can get more data about other African countries, uh, about the gender dimensions of tax administration, but also what that means in terms of performance. And also useful if, if we can use um, that data to ask um, more questions about what this means for the, the performance of, of, of the revenue authority, what this means of the relationship that taxpayers um, have with the revenue authority. At the subnational level, if we go back to the study that we talked about that was undertaken in Nigeria, we found that in some markets there were a mixed um, gender tax collectors and they found that both male and female traders preferred to have the the mixed gender uh, tax collectors as opposed to a number of some markets which just had men and female tax collectors were normally reported to be more calm they were more understanding and they were also less violent Another area we can look at to understand the gender dimensions of taxation is tax compliance by asking the question, are female taxpayers more tax, more tax compliant than male taxpayers? There are several studies that have been undertaken on gender and tax compliance. However, many of these studies are not in African countries and they also are best mostly on perception surveys and laboratory experiments. And the way these work for perception surveys, for example, is that randomly selected participants are asked questions such as, to respond to questions such as, it is wrong not to pay your taxes, or it is your duty to pay tax. It is not wrong to understand the in your income since it does not hurt anyone. And then depending, and, and then the response is used as a proxy for either compliance or non-compliance. When it comes to laboratory experiments, participants are normally uh, set a task that they perform and then they're paid an experimental currency. And it's, it's explained to them, you know, what the real life tax paying situation is. Taxes are paid twice a year and you may be audited. And, you, you know, these are the penalties if you're non-compliant, if you under declare your income. And the researchers want to understand the kind of um, deterrence that, that that different taxpayers have or, or or the kind of incentives that 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 the participants react to and these these studies are useful in as far as they tell us about taxpayer behavior and attitude so they are useful for us to see what kind of incentives men and women react to but then they don't tell us a lot about what happens when people are faced with the real life situations of having to pay taxes. We do have um, two recent studies in Africa that look at the gender dimensions of tax compliance. And one of those was a study that was undertaken in 2020 in Ethiopia, where the researchers were trying used a combination of survey um, responses and audit data from the revenue authority in Ethiopia to understand the gender dimensions of small, um, medium and large businesses. And in their research, they found that female owned businesses were on average more likely to be tax compliant than men, male owned businesses.
Another study was undertaken in Uganda where they were studying the tax compliance of sole proprietors, most of which are small businesses. And they, uh, the researchers used uh, URA data. In, in that study, they found that it was more difficult to, to, to understand the, the gender dimensions of tax compliance. When, when they looked at filing tax returns, for example, women were found to be significantly more uh, compliant. However, when it came to actual tax paying, it varied because the researchers were looking at three years and it varied from one year to another. In one year, women paid more. In another year, men were more, um, compliant with tax paying. In another year, there were no significant differences. And, and what that research raised was the issue of reliability of, of, of data that revenue authorities have, but also how difficult it is to actually measure compliance. So we definitely need more studies of this. We, we need more studies in African countries, preferably using actual taxpayer data. We also need to understand if, if, if we're saying that women pay uh, uh, more tax compliance, why are they more tax compliant? Is it because they fear uh, penalties? Is it because they do not have um, taxpayer education and so end up paying a lot more than they should actually be paying? And this brings us to the towards the end of, of, of our discussion of, of what more research do we need to undertake to, to understand the gender dimensions of tax compliance? The short answer to that is that we still need a lot more research because we still know very little because what the research that has been done so far shows us is that the experiences sometimes vary from one country to another and even within the same country they can be variations. So um, we need we definitely need more research but what are some of the questions that would be interesting to look at? We, we, we need more research on the role of women in tax administration. We have the URA study. A lot more can still be done on the URA to understand what does it mean to have more women in the URA. But we also need uh, more studies in other countries. And, and, and we need more studies on policy making. If we have more women in parliament, are they more likely to make laws that benefit women, tax laws that benefit women? We, we don't know that yet. Um, we need more evidence on the impact of small and informal taxes and fees, you know, including what explains the gender differences. Why, for example, do we find women in Sierra Leone paying more in informal taxes than men do? We also need more research on the gender dimensions of tax compliance, as we've said, using uh, uh, tax administrative data. And another thing that you know has has come out clearly is that taxpayer education is important, you know. But do we really understand what the gender differences in tax awareness are? You know, research um, trying to tell us more about the the understanding of men and women of tax systems would be quite helpful, and it would also be helpful. Uh, for revenue authorities so that they know the steps that they should take to ensure that both men and women access tax ed education. And lastly, what through what channels do women and men in the informal sector engage with the tax system? What is the role of things such as taxpayer associations? Do they help with bargaining uh, for taxes? Do, do they help with making um, fiscal contracts? Um, so a lot more, again, needs to be studied. We, we, we are in a good place in the sense that we know a lot more than we knew five uh, about five years ago, at least as, as far as Africa is concerned. But we definitely need more research to, to, to really understand what gender means in tax administration. Sorry, in, in taxation generally. Thank you. And... Um, Yes, um, if you are interested in learning more about um, 
gender and tax there's there's lots that's on the ictd website there are many papers there are policy briefs and and we are also going to be putting you know a number of you know short videos just just to help and and encourage the discussion around this so thank you very much